the red blood cells are almost the entire diameter of the capillary itself, and they flow through in single file. So that slows them down long enough to either pick up the oxygen or to transfer the oxygen if they're in the tissue. So this image, I added all the little circles. Um, this image shows the oxygen, and there are two ways in which it can be transported. And the first way is dissolved in the blood. <clears throat> this was all the ice fish had. Okay, dissolved in plasma. This amount of oxygen is what gives us the value of our PO2. So PO2 is going to be equal to the amount of oxygen dissolved in the plasma because it is still acting as a gas. All right, now if I'm a gas molecule and I'm moving around and I'm bumping into that wall and coming over here and bumping into that wall, I'm acting as a gas molecule. I'm creating a force. I'm bumping into water molecules and other gas molecules. So that force, that gas pressure can be measured. Okay? Now, as a gas molecule, if I, an oxygen molecule, if I am tethered to an iron atom on a hemoglobin, I'm no longer moving around. I'm no longer creating a force, a gas pressure. So while the oxygen is bound to the iron ion of hemoglobin, it is not affecting PO2. It has to be free in the plasma to affect PO2. All right, so if I were to draw a segment of volume of blood, the circles represent oxygen molecules. There's a red blood cell. change the illustration. So, so obviously the next mechanism of transport of oxygen is bound to hemoglobin. So this is similar to that second pattern. So this is bound to the heme section, the heme component, which is iron plus some uh, amino acids. And that's by far how most of our oxygen is transported. That PO2 would be zero, and you would never see that existing. Why would that not work? We're going to look at this in a few moments um, when we talk about our oxygen dissociation curve. But why would that not be functional? You've got 100% saturation. Every single iron ion in your hemoglobin molecules is attached to oxygen. Because then it would be stable and it would not change? Exactly. The affinity would be so high, the attraction between iron and oxygen would be so high that it would never come off and never leave the red blood cell and never get to the tissues. So it really doesn't do any good to have oxygen bound to hemoglobin if it never is willing to go to the tissues where it's actually going to be utilized. As we'll see, we'll cover it in more depth tomorrow with carbon monoxide, that is one of the effects of carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is not 
deadly because it displaces oxygen in the plasma. It's deadly because it competes for a binding site with oxygen on the iron. And not only that, not only does it take up the place of oxygen, but it keeps the oxygen that does get to bind to iron from leaving. So individuals that have carbon monoxide poisoning will still have the pink fingernails and pink lips, sometimes cherry red lips, but their tissues are dying of ox lack of oxygen, okay, even though the blood vessels have a good PO2 because the oxygen tension would be normal, but there's not enough oxygen going to the body, right? So we'll come back and look at how that occurs. So now let's see how, what happens as the oxygen, what's the relationship between PO2 and oxygen? We call this the amount when we're, re when we're comparing this. We talk about this as percent saturation of hemoglobin. That's how we measure how much oxygen is being transported by the red blood cell, percent hemoglobin saturation. And we measure the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma as PO2. So if someone's having their arterial blood gases measured, they're looking at PO2 or PCO2. Say that again. Okay. That's when it's acting as a gas. A pulse, a pulse oximeter is measuring percent <coughs> hemoglobin saturation in arterial blood. The one that's the thing on your mm -hmm. finger that might measure hemoglobin. Percent saturation of hemoglobin. All right, so what happens now Let's, let's look at how this works. Give myself a little bit more room over here. So when the oxygen diffuses out of the alveolus and into the blood, it is changing what number? PO2 or percent hemoglobin saturation? PO2, because it's in the plasma, all right? And so, as we build up oxygen in our plasma, if there is no oxygen in our red blood cell, that concentration is going to drive oxygen into the red blood cell. So the more oxygen there is in the plasma, the more oxygen there will be bound to the red blood cell, bound to the iron ion. Now, as I move this oxygen, into my red blood cell, that creates more room, lowers the gradient slightly, and encourages more oxygen to diffuse out of the blood. Because if my PO2, my alveolar air is 104, I'm never going to get 120 millimeters of mercury in my plasma. It's not going to go against the gradient. So the best that can happen is when my blood leaves the lungs and heads back to the heart, the partial pressure in the alveoli is going to be equilibrated to and equal the partial pressure in my plasma. Now, it might be lower. Let's say I have pneumonia and I have fluid in my lungs and it takes so long for oxygen to diffuse through that fluid that it never equilibrates. Okay? And the CO2 never equilibrates. So if there's problems with the respiratory membrane or with the blood flow, when the blood leaves the lungs, we may not have the same PO2 as we did in the alveoli. Okay, we'll look at various forms of hypoxia um, tomorrow. So as the, this is showing the four iron ions that are attract, attracting the oxygen. So as that oxygen moves into the red blood cell, it's going to interact with an iron ion. And as we've discussed earlier, this is not a permanent chemical bond. We don't want it to be, because then it would never get to the tissues. So we talk about the attraction between these two components using the term affinity. If two components, two chemicals, have a high affinity for each other, that chemical bond lasts for a longer period of time. If they have a low affinity, 
They are bonded chemically, and then the bond is broken and they separate. Okay. So once the first, it's, it's more difficult for that first oxygen to bind to the first iron ion. But once it does so, it changes the shape and relationship of the other molecules, of the other components of the hemoglobin, so that the second oxygen binds more easily with a higher affinity and the fourth one even more so. So this continues to occur as the blood is flowing through the alveoli, oxygen is moving into the red blood cell, oxygen is moving into the plasma to replace it. So the more oxygen I have out in the plasma, the more likely that oxygen has moved into and bound to my hemoglobin molecule. Okay. If I have low PO2, what is that going to mean about saturation? I'm not going to be able to have enough oxygen molecules to saturate every hemoglobin molecule. All right. So I will still have oxygen out here, but the pressure, the PO2, is not enough to completely saturate every hemoglobin molecule. So what does the body do? It makes additional red blood cells. If I'm only, if I'm only carrying 50%, the PO2 is so low, I still have oxygen out here, all right? And it can diffuse in, but it doesn't have the, the force to move in there. But if I have another red blood cell over here, then this oxygen will move in here. And I'll have two red blood cells that are 50% saturated at a higher altitude. So that's one of the ways in which the body compensates is to release erythropoietin from the kidneys, which stimulates the addition of new red blood cells. And so someone who lives at, out, at a higher altitude has thicker blood because they can only find a limited number to each hemoglobin. And so they make more red blood cells to compensate for that. Okay. Now, let's look at the hemoglobin molecule and the relationship of how we change that affinity. There's a little bit more of physics and chemistry in here than I'm requiring you to know. Uh, probably more than is in your textbook, but, but for those of you that are interested, it may help be easier to understand these effects. Okay. So hemoglobin has two alpha chains and two beta chains that interact, and within each of these chains is the hemo, heme molecule or heme component. All the rest of this in color is called the globin component. Right? So when we talk about carbon dioxide binding to hemoglobin, it binds to this globin component, makes carboxy hemoglobin. All right? Oxygen makes oxyhemoglobin. But oxygen enters into this structure of the um, heme group. And right here in the center, these are a whole bunch of nitrogen ions around here, is iron. So oxygen has to get into and among these amino acids. It has to fit in there to actually bind to that iron ion. And once it does so, the overall shape of the relationship changes, and that's what makes it easier for the next one to bind to it. All right, so here is the iron. Those red molecules I showed in that previous picture were all these nitrogen groups. All right, and then we have a histidine residue that has that component of the amino acid. So this is that part of it, the structure that I'm not going to test you on, but it has to do with the shape, the structure, the physical change in the room that there is present for oxygen that changes the affinity. Okay? So when the shape changes so it's difficult for the oxygen to stay there, it comes off. It's like kind of squeezing a grape out of its skin. Okay? It just kind of doesn't fit there. So here's the shape of this relationship of the heme and its histidine component when oxygen isn't bound and when it does it has a flattened plane. 
All right, so well, I think I showed this animation previously where you can see it bending as oxygen attaches. Mm. And that makes it easier for the second oxygen to bind and easier for the third and easier for the fourth. So that's what I want you to know is that change in affinity, but you don't have to know the, the porphyrin term or the density residue term. Um, I discussed it on page 58, okay? But I'm not going to test you on those uh, chemistry descriptions in the middle of page 58. Now, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail tomorrow because we're going to come back and look at these concepts again tomorrow briefly because I need to give you some time to sleep on it. And go back and read your textbook and, and figure it out from there. But this is showing the globin portion. This is the hema portion, all right? And oxygen fits in here. One of the structures that we're going to be talking about that interferes with iron binding to oxygen is a molecule that the red blood cell actually makes. Um, and that, again, affects the physical shape so that it's difficult for oxygen to bind there. Okay, so that's what I mean when you think of the hydrogen ions, pH. A low pH means additional hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions bind to amino acids and protonate them, meaning adding a proton. That binding changes the shape, okay? Carbon dioxide binds to this portion, the globin portion. That changes the shape and, again, makes it more difficult for the oxygen to fit with that iron. Does the carbon dioxide bind to the alpha down the betas or just the alpha? I'll have to double check. <laughs> Is it just the alpha? <laughs> because it's the fetal beta that uh, has the higher affinity for oxygen. But, all right, so the oxyhemoglobin is just oxygen isn't attached to the iron, and oxy means iron is attached. Okay? And then we'll have. Uh, carboxyhemoglobin is carbon monoxide, and carbaminoglobin is carbon dioxide. We'll look at those terms again tomorrow. But what I want to do before we got about 15 more minutes here um, is to look at this relationship. This covers what I said for the last 10, 15 minutes. So we're gonna we're gonna look at the, what this means. And we're going to look briefly at factors that affect it, and then we're going to start with this tomorrow, okay? So may I erase what's on the board here? Please do. We're going to focus on this right here now. Mm -hmm. chairs. When my daughter was in elementary school, their teacher, I'm not sure what she was trying to illustrate, but she had the kids jumping from one desk to the next. Awesome. <laughs> wow. Until one kid fell and broke her arm. <laughs> and when my daughter told me that, I said, you're kidding, your teacher actually had you up on top of your desk jumping? I mean, that's just so full of insurance risk and everything. I was like, whoa, okay. But let's say that we were playing a game of musical chairs, all right? And I had five chairs, normal chairs. You know, they're, they're not going to spin around like this, but five folding chairs and five chairs on both sides. So we have these chairs. And those chairs represent, well, I'll tell you what they're, you can figure it out. And I have 40 people. And the music's playing. And 40 people are running around, okay? And when the music stops, what's the likelihood that every chair is going to have a person in it? Very good. Pretty good, okay? That's the normal relationship between oxygen dissolved in the plasma. So the people running around are the PO2. And the people sitting in the chairs is the saturation of hemoglobin, okay? So in that illustration, with 40 people, I'm going to get 100% saturation of my hemoglobin. Now let's say that I only have five people. And they run around. And even if I wait and wait and wait, those chairs are never going to be completely filled. Okay, so I have to have 
a sufficient amount of oxygen dissolved in my plasma to ensure that oxygen is moving into the red blood cell and binding to the iron. Now let's say that when the people sit there, they're just not going to sit there, they're going to get up again. So I have all 10 chairs occupied and 30 people milling around, and one person gets up. Someone else, Someone else is going to sit right there, especially if they think they're going to win some money. Okay? <laughs> if I have all the seats filled and only two people are moving around, when that person gets off of the chair, eventually it will get filled, but it's going to take longer. And someone else might come off of their chair before another person sits in that chair. So again, with a lower PO2, it's more difficult to make sure that at any given time, oxygen is bound to the iron atom ion. Does that make sense? Okay. So that gives us our first mental reference to understand the oxygen dissociation curve. So on the bottom, we have arterial PO2. Again, that's the number. If, if it helps you, just think of 60 oxygen molecules and 100 oxygen molecules. Okay, just to, if pressure is hard for you to visualize. Think of 60 different oxygen molecules milling around the red blood cell, or 600. Now, the maximum value up here is 100, and this is in millimeters of mercury, or it could be four. I don't want you to think that 100 is the limit. If you're breathing pure oxygen, that can go up to, who knows, okay? 120 if you're breathing under pressure, even higher. So 100 is the maximum. Remember I said normal is about 104. Our vertical, this is our x-axis of your forgotten graph. The y-axis has to do with percent saturation of hemoglobin. The SA there is referring to um, arterial saturation. Now, and that we will talk out at 100%. What if our graph looked like that? What would that mean? How would you interpret that graph? High saturation. High saturation. High saturation. You could get you could get your hemoglobin 100% saturated, um, almost all the way up to the mount, top of Mount Everest. What's Mount Everest? 26,000 feet. So maybe up around 19 or 20,000 feet, you would still have 100% saturation of your hemoglobin. What's the problem with that? We talked about it near the beginning of class. What was the PO2 of blood when it came back to the lungs? 40. Well, if we have 100% saturation at 10 millimeters of mercury, and the tissues are at 40, the oxygen and the hemoglobin would never dissociate. Uh, it just keeps cycling around and around and would never get to the tissues. Maybe just a few, because by then the tissue cells would be dead. And it would be zero. All right? So this is great for saturating our hemoglobin at the lungs, but it doesn't work at the tissue level. Okay? All right, what about this graph? Even if I breathe pure oxygen, I can get more than 15% saturation. That's not going to be enough to keep me alive. My blood would be like mud. I'd have so many red blood cells. Okay, so obviously our body works on something in between. And that's why we get that kind of sinus-shaped curve here. So it has a steep gradient. And it has a plateau. 
means is we can get 90 to 100 percent saturation at a PO2 of around 60 to 70. That means at 8,000 feet, you might get tired, but you're still going to get like 85% saturation of your hemoglobin. Okay. However, it means that when we get down to the PO2 of tissues between 40 and 60, notice how rapidly that oxygen comes off of the hemoglobin. All right, so back to our red blood cell. At a PO2 of 100, we have 100% saturation, and here's our PO2 of 100. Here's the capillary wall, and out here are the tissues. The tissues have been making ATP, they're using up oxygen, so <coughs> oxygen diffuses first out of the plasma, So what is that going to do to my PO2 in the plasma? Bring it down. It's going to drop. And as these capillaries keep giving up oxygen, and my PO2 drops, what happens to the oxygen binding to my red blood cells? Remember? The first one on, the last one on was really easy to, to bind. Okay, it's going to be more difficult to come off. So it's going to come off at, it's going to, it's, but we, well, we reverse it. So the last one actually is more difficult to come off. The first one is a lot, it's first easy to come off, so it comes off easily. And then as we get lower and lower PO2s, that last one that went on really easily and is harder to come off, well, by then, we're down at a tissue PO2 of around 45 or 48. So finally we get oxygen dissociated. So that's where we get the steep gradient. This represents the lung. And this represents the tissues. So we get the best of both worlds. Where we have a high PO2, we can saturate our hemoglobin. But it doesn't hold on to it so tightly that when we get to the tissues and we need it, that it doesn't let go. So that's critical that you understand what this means. So in this range, of oxygen dissolved in the plasma, whenever any oxygen happens to come off, there's enough oxygen surrounding it in the plasma to replace it right away. When we get to the tissues, and when that oxygen is leaving, and it's going to the tissues, now when an oxygen comes off, the rest of the oxygens come off even more easily than that first one, as long as we get going to lower and lower PO2 values. So the first one comes off easily, but we're still around 60 or 55. That last one wouldn't come off if we stayed at 60 or 65. But as we get to areas of tissues that need more and more oxygen, even those will dissociate. Not all, they never all come off. Remember our PO2, in the, even in the plasma, is at 40. All right? So this is called the oxygen dissociation curve, showing that representation. Now, what does it mean if I draw that curve and I shift it to the right? Notice most of that shift takes place in the steep gradient. Up here, there's not too much change. I'm still able to saturate. So as a comparison factor, we look at 50% oxygen saturation and what did we say about the PO2 of the blood to get 50% oxygen saturation if the curve is shifted to the right? Do we need more or less oxygen in the blood? Does this number, to keep 50% of the oxygen molecules here, do we have to have fewer or more oxygen dissolved in the plasma? 
more. That's what a higher PO2 value means. That is not the critical part of what I'm trying to show here. That merely illustrates that the oxygen is coming off more easily. And because the oxygen is coming off more easily, we need more oxygen dissolved in the plasma to keep what's there there. Okay, so it's not so much that there's a higher PO2, it's that there's a less of attraction, there's less room because of the change in the shape of the hemoglobin. The oxygen doesn't stay associated for as long. Back to the musical chairs illustration. Now you're beginning to understand why I want you to sleep on this. Okay. Musical chairs illustration. Instead of our chair being shaped like a chair, all right, and by being shaped like a chair, I mean this, our chair is now shaped like that. So when the person sits on it, they're going to slide right up, okay? So we have 10 chairs and 25 people. Running around in circles, the music stops, everybody sits on a chair. They'll stay there very long before they slip to the floor, okay? Now we need more people so that when they do sleep to, slip to the floor, we need no, more people to make sure someone else is sitting on that chair. Because when they do sit there, they slide right off again. And so to make sure there's always someone on that chair, we have to add more people to the group available because half of them are sliding off. So we need more people available, so every time someone slides off, there's another person to sit on that chair. The critical point of that illustration is that the chair has changed and they're sliding off. The fact that we need more people there really illustrates that. Okay? So what I want you to get from shifting the curve to the right is that oxygen and iron don't stay attached to each other very long. Any situation that shifts the curve to the right makes it more difficult for oxygen to fit into and associate with the iron. That's what this means. Because we don't add more oxygen to the blood, okay? We're just saying that that illustrates the fact that it's not staying there very long because we need to to maintain the same saturation. This is a, an experimental kind of measurement. So what kind of conditions would affect the shape of the hemoglobin or the movement of the oxygen? Well, the first one on your list is temperature. So if someone is exercising or they have a fever, that higher temperature imparts more energy to the oxygen molecule. It sits there and it bangs around a little bit more. It's like trying to hold a wiggly child. Okay, you put a wiggly child on that chair, even a flat chair, they're not going to stay there very long. So when oxygen has more energy due to the temperature, it doesn't stay attached to the iron as long. It comes off more easily. Which works well because when we're exercising, we need that oxygen at a faster rate. Okay? Another factor that would shift the curve to the right is increased carbon dioxide. In the morning class, someone said, well, how, does this, how is this affected by COPD? And I hadn't yet talked about carbon dioxide. I said, well, that's a nice segue. It leads me in. Carbon dioxide has two effects. Carbon dioxide itself will bind to the globin part of our hemoglobin molecule and change the shape so oxygen doesn't fit very well. It gets squeezed out. <clears throat> Not only that, but as we'll see tomorrow, carbon dioxide forms carbonic acid. And that adds more hydrogen ions to the plasma. And the hydrogen ions themselves changing will, will attach, um, make the amino acids have positive charges. And that changes the shape of the globin protein and interferes with the carbon dioxide, the oxygen interacting with, with the iron. Okay, we'll look at a couple of others that bis, 2, 3, bis, biphosphate glycerate we'll look at tomorrow as well. We'll come, like I said, we're going to come back and review this tomorrow after you've had a chance to kind of mull it over and diagram it out yourself. <clears throat>
But before we leave, what is the effect of shifting the curve to the left? What does that mean? There is a higher affinity. So back to our chairs. So this is a right shift effect. A left shift effect is if we took our chair and we pushed the seat up. Now when you sit in it, your knees are bent like this and your feet aren't even touching the floor. And to get out, you have to push yourself up on the, on the arm, um, arms of the chair, and if it doesn't have any arms, then you're kind of stuck. So it's going to be harder to get out. So when the music starts, it might be a couple of minutes before you can even get out of your chair. All right? And when the music stops and you sit down, there's no way you're sliding off. You're stuck there, you know, until you can push yourself out. And so it doesn't take now as many people to make sure there's always somebody in the chair because the people that are in the chair aren't leaving. They may not leave for five minutes. So just a couple of extra people are going to be plenty to ensure there's always somebody sitting in each chair because it takes them so long to get up. And so when we look at the shift to the left, we see that reflected by a lower PO2 required for the same amount of saturation. And again, it's not so much the lower PO2 as it is reflecting the higher affinity. The hemoglobin and oxygen are going to stay, the iron and oxygen are going to stay bound to each other for a longer period of time. We see this effect with carbon monoxide and in the fetus. The structure of fetal hemoglobin is such that it holds on to the oxygen, which is helpful because, of course, it's getting its oxygen from the mother, and it starts off at a lower PO2 to begin with. So we're going to stop here. We'll start tomorrow morning with the oxygen dissociation curve again, all right, and go over this, and then we'll look at carbon dioxide transport. <laughs>